My job this morning is to tell you a little bit about this new field that Joey mentioned this morning called synthetic biology and what has everybody so excited about synthetic biology. So what is synthetic biology? So the idea of synthetic biology is using synthetic genes to program not microprocessors but microorganisms to make devices, sensors, or chemical factories that can build pharmaceuticals, renewable chemicals, new foods. So how does that work? How do we, what do I mean by programming synthetic biology? So actually programming happens at two different scales within biology, within synthetic biology. The first scale is seen down here in this lower left picture. This is a piece of machinery, molecular machinery, that exists within all of our cells called a ribosome. And basically what it does is it can read a program, a set of synthetic genes that's seen in turquoise in the bottom, and that gets threaded through this machine. And every three bases of this piece of DNA called, these bases are called nucleotides, every three of those is called a codon. And every three of those codon codes for a building block of a protein called an amino acid. And so as this tape gets strung through this piece of machinery, it instructs or programs the ribosome to build proteins for us. This is reminiscent to the early computers that we had, the early tape computers. The only difference is that this is about a million times smaller uh, than what's uh, going on in uh, the early computers. And it's really the only way that we know of, the only tool that we have of actually being able to build at the molecular size scale programmatically. So what can we do with that? Well, one thing that you can build from proteins in addition to the structure that makes all of us as people, all of our, the uh, structural proteins that build uh, organisms, is that proteins can also fold up into three-dimensional shapes and create catalysts to drive chemical reactions. Those catalysts are called enzymes. And we can make a whole program of those enzymes and drive a set of chemical syntheses that start from an initial input, like a glucose molecule, and five or 10 steps later, produce an output, like a 1,3-propane dial. This is uh, an example from DuPont of a polyester that, as Joey mentioned this morning, is vastly less expensive, more energy efficient uh, than the similar exact same molecule that's made from petroleum feedstocks. And the reason for that is that enzymes are extremely good at catalyzing chemical reactions because they are crafted, if you will, at the molecular scale. They can put the two molecules that you want to bring together uh, with great precision and they can have they can have yields or probabilities of driving that chemical reaction uh, that are very, very high in the 90 plus percent. So the other thing that we can do in synthetic biology uh, that constitutes programming is actually create universal logic. And this was a classic paper by a uh, Mike Elowitz, who's now at Caltech, and basically what he said is that when, whenever we build something in the semiconductor space, a chip, for instance, uh, one of the test circuits that we build is something called a ring oscillator, a couple of transistors where the output of one transistor turns off the input of the next one and so forth, and then the last one is strung back to the first one. And so Mike said, should it be possible or is it possible to build that out of genes? And the answer to that turns out to be yes. You can create something on the right, which is a plasmid. In yellow, you see something called TET. That's a protein. In front of that is a promoter that can turn on that yellow gene. And the output of that gene, that TET, is a protein that's not structural. It's not an enzyme. But what it does is it comes and sits on that little blue patch, and it turns off the next gene. And the next gene in red, called LAC, makes a protein, and it comes and it sits on that yellow, little yellow patch, and it turns off the next gene, and so forth. And that is exactly analogous to what we do in the transistor space. And in fact, if you hook all of that up and put that inside of a bacteria, you get something not a, that's like this sine wave on the left that comes from electronics, 
you get what's pictured on the right, you get this exact analogous oscillatory pattern. The only difference is that on the right, that oscillation is continuing to grow. And the reason for that is that when you've put this program into one of these bacteria, the bacteria itself does something that we don't yet know how to do or we're not very good at in hardware, which is self-replicating hardware. This is a great and useful capability. We'd love to be able to do that in hardware. Biology is very, very good at that, and it's so good at that that it can replicate the program that's running inside. And if this video plays, you'll see on the left, these are these bacteria that are running these little ring oscillators inside. Really, really cool uh, devices. Now, one problem with this is you can see that they quickly get out of phase because there's nothing that is phasing up all of those programs as they're running individually. But if you extend that a little bit and you make a little bit of communication between the two cells, or between all of the cells that are running this program, you can get them all to sync up. The program that does that is pictured on the bottom. That's what's called a genetic circuit or metabolic circuit. And this is the way that we program devices like this. So I just want to quickly remind all of us kind of what this process looks like in the silicon space and then think about where we are in synthetic biology. So in the silicon space, when we want to make a new product, we go into a design library on the upper left. We can pull down circuits that harness the intellectual uh, fruits of an innovation from around the globe. So these libraries are populated with circuits that many different people have designed. And I can suck those down. I can design a circuit that I want. I can go into a fab. And about three weeks later, I have my first working silicon. So the question is, where are we in the synthetic biology space? And we're kind of around here. We're at the beginning. So you may remember, or probably very few people in this room remember, but there was a point in time where we had, before we had integrated circuits, we had discrete silicon transistors that all had to be wired up together in order to make a circuit. And there was a great term of art at that time called the tyranny of numbers. And basically what the tyranny of numbers was, was there were so many great ideas of circuits and devices people wanted to build. But if the complexity of what you were trying to build was greater than about 4,000 transistors or so, the probability of wiring all those up and it all working was almost zero. And this was the tyranny of numbers, that basically our creativity and the things that we wanted to build and the things we had designs for, we had no way to build until we came along with the integrated circuit that gave us Moore's law and gave us the ability to harness uh, all of that creativity. So that, in a nutshell, is kind of where we are in the synthetic biology space or, or where we were until very recently. So the machines that build DNA kind of look like this on the left. They have a number of different reagents. These are the bases of DNA, A, Gs, Ts, and Cs, the nucleotide bases. And this machine can basically build one strand of DNA at a time. It takes about five minutes to add each base of DNA. And remember, I want to build things for a, a typical program. I want to build things that are about 10,000 to 100,000 bases long. Now, we know that biology knows how to do this trick much better. Each of us has a genome that consists of about 3 billion different bases. So we know there must be some machinery inside of all of us, inside of all of our cells, that is extremely good at writing DNA. And in fact, that piece of machinery is called polymerase. That's a, another piece of protein machinery. And it can zip along a piece of DNA, copy a DNA, and this is how our cells replicate. And it does a brilliant thing, which is unlike the chemistry and the box on the left, the DNA synthesizer, what this piece of machinery can do is as it's zipping along at about 1,000 bases a second, not once every 300 seconds, but 1,000 times per second, it's putting down a base. It checks. It has a little error correcting module. And what it can do is look and see that each base that it puts down is absolutely the correct base. And because of that error correction at the molecular scale, it allows this piece of machinery to move very, very quickly. So when we kind of looked at this problem and said, what's the big missing thing that we need in the synthetic biology space? It's really to create a fab, <laughs> excuse me, to create a Moore's Law or geometrically scaling fab 
for biology that we can build all of the things that we want to be able to build. And so the way that we did that was we said, let's build a capability, and this is together with colleagues from Harvard, George Church, and Drew Endy, who's now at Stanford. Let's go build a capability where we can design on the computer the programs that we want, go build those onto a chip. These chips look something like this. You have about a million uh, spots of DNA that are all separately programmable. And then we can apply the same kind of error correction so that we can, as we build, we can correct any errors that occur. And this really, for the first time, allows us to build uh, DNA in a, in a Moore's law or in a geometrically scaling way. So if you take a look at this map, these are kinds of the numbers that one needs to get to. So if you want to build something like a bacteria, you need about a megabase to 10 megabases. If you want to build the next complexity up in nature, like a C. elegans, you need about 100 megabases. If you look at that set of bottles there, that is the current global annual capacity for gene synthesis. It's only about 250 megabases. That's all of the DNA that all of the world builds in a year. So if you have ideas or things that you want to do, for instance, you want to build all the enzymes that exist in GenBank, uh, that would take you something like six years just syncing or sourcing all of that DNA. And so what we did is we built this capability, and this is now a company that's been spun off called Gen9, uh, which is the first company that's building what's called next generation DNA synthesis or chip-based DNA synthesis. And so on one of our chips, we have about the same capacity as the total annual capacity. And in a single year, the number of chips that we can build is somewhere on the order of about 200 gigabases uh, of DNA. That's equal to about the number of different sequences that have been sequenced and sit inside of GenBank. That, those are the things that one wants to build. So very, very quickly, just to, to wrap up, the two pieces that we really needed to do to bring this on the level with electronics is one, to create a design library. If you go to this organization, parts.igem.org, there's a whole number of different parts. Let's say you want to build a bacteria that lives inside of you. It has little sensors. It has little data logging. You go here. You pick out all those parts. And now you can go to this fab capability, design that on the screen, press a button, and start to build these apps and devices inside of synthetic biology. Anybody who's interested, please come and find me. We'd love to get more and more electrical engineers and folks from computer science involved in this. Um, it's really exciting. Thank you. <laughs>